Let me give you a brief introduction to different dimensions to consider when selecting a research design. You see here a table produced by Jan Recker in 2013. The different spectra, the different dimensions to consider are the method. At one end of the continuum, you have the qualitative methods, like interviews, case studies, ethnography, and the like. On the other end of the continuum, you have the quantitative methods, like large-scale structured surveys or experiments. Then the next thing to consider is the aim. On the one hand, the exploratory. You want to explore, you want to find out new things. On the explanatory, you want to explain, you want to uh, understand the causal relationships and test their existence. Then the next thing is the boundary of a research design. One would be the case. You look at the individual case and in dips depth in the individual case and the value your data sets there. And at the other end of the continuum, you have the statistical approach. We have lots of data of different cases or one case over time, and you do statistical analysis on that. Then the next thing is the setting, either in the field, out there in the wild, or in the laboratory in a rather controlled setting. Next dimension is the timing. A cross-sectional study, for example, surveying many individuals or many firms at one point in time makes a cross-section, or longitudinal study, observing the same individuals, the same firms, or whatever your unit of analysis is, over time, multiple observations for each individual, each firm was like. Then the next dimension is the outcome. Either the outcome is something descriptive, or it is a causal model, a causal theory. And there are differences in ambition. You can either aim to understand the world, or design something which changes the world, hopefully makes it better. Understanding is more the behavioral research part, designing is more the design science research part. Now I only touch very briefly upon this different spectra and this different ends of the continuum. There's a lot more to be read and said about that. So I encourage you, when thinking about which research design to choose, to think about these different dimensions, to be clear about your position there, but for getting there, you need to go a lot deeper than what I just told you. No further, to me, very helpful table, also provided by Jan Recker, based on the work from Gable from 1994, is differences in research strategies. He here shows a list of different requirements and then compares qualitative, quantitative, and design science research along these different requirements. I mean, at best, you want to have a research strategy that is highly controllable, highly deductible, highly repeatable, highly generalizable, highly explorable, and delivers complex results. But as you already see from a first look at this table, there's no dominant paradigm, no dominant strategy, whether you go for qualitative, quantitative, or design science. They all have their respective strengths and weaknesses in terms of these requirements. So let's go through it a little more in detail. Controllability. It's about the question how strongly are you able to control your research settings and your research findings. In a qualitative setting, in an ethnography or in a case study, controllability is low. You immerse deeply into the context and you don't control it. In the quantitative study, if you think about structured surveys or experiments, well, then you control at least the data collection in the survey. Um, but in the experiment, you even control the environment and the stimuli, so controllability is a lot higher there. And in design science, it's typically high because you design the artifacts, you bring them into the world, so you control what they look like, what their design looks like. Deductibility is about your ability to use deductive reasoning as an inference strategy. For qualitative research, it's typically low because you have little observation, you have was a little understanding of the complexity of the entire context, so it's hard to apply deductions there. On the quantitative research, it's again, as for controllability, a lot stronger. But here on design science, it's typically very low because the design is deeply immersed into the specific context and typically the design has many different features which interact, so it's difficult to deduce the effect of individual of these features or elements of the entire design. The next requirement is repeatability. At best, research is repeatable so that others can test your conclusions. For qualitative studies, as mentioned before, ethnography or case studies as prime examples, repeatability is low. 
you'll never come back to exactly that context the same time, the same individuals and so on. So it can't really be repeated exactly, only approximately. For quantitative studies, repeatability is typically a lot higher, especially because it's more controlled. And for design science, well, repeatability is high because you can go through the same design process, you can build the same artifact again because it's all in your control there. So it's easy, rather easy to repeat. Generalizability, for the qualitative part, it's typically low because you only observed one instance, a few instances. For them, you get a very rich understanding, but it's very difficult to transfer this understanding to other contexts. For the quantitative part, where you typically have a broader sample and typically apply statistical techniques, the generalizability tends to be higher. But then for the design science, it's very low again. Explorability is about your ability to use exploration to fully understand the workings, the mechanisms, the phenomena under study. This is typically rather high for the qualitative studies, where you can really go in-depth and explore new causal relationships, new reasons for these relationships, new constructs, new understanding of the phenomena. For the quantitative part, explorability is usually a lot lower, likewise for design science. So finally, a requirement for research strategy is its ability to address the complexity of research phenomena. And here complexity is a good thing, because the real world is complex, the phenomena are complex, and you want to understand this complexity, and you want to then abstract it and reduce it for having a theory which you can communicate to others and which can be applied elsewhere. But here, thinking about complexity, the qualitative research methods are typically high. They allow you to grasp the full complexity of the phenomena. While the quantitative and the design science are lower, also the design science might be a little higher on complexity than the quantitative methods. So as you see, and as I said before, there's no dominant paradigm, no dominant decision whether you go for qualitative, quantitative, or design science for achieving these different requirements. But there's pros and cons of the different approaches. So whatever approach you take needs to fit to your aim, to your research problem, and to the kind of knowledge you want to contribute, and to the state of the discourse on that topic, because that changes what type of knowledge you could contribute. Mm -hmm.